Hey everyone, good morning or good afternoon. Good morning, I guess it's morning, afternoon here, but good morning everyone. It's so good to be here on the Sacred Grounds podcast with the Indigenous Peoples Knowledge Community with uh, NASPA. We are your hosts today, brand new hosts. My name is Dr. Amanda Chermaya. And my name is Renette Curry. Awesome. We are the professional development co-chairs. How exciting. We have this new title. <laughs> I yes. like to call they net my conference BFF. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And just, it's so ironic how we met and it was just, it was, it, I think we'll go into that story here in a little bit, but yes, conference BFFs. Yeah, we actually met um, in the summer of or August of last year in 2022 um, in Wilmington, North Carolina, of all places. (laughs) I know you could like pick one place on the map. It's (laughs) all randomly in North Carolina. (laughs) And mind you, I just booked my flight, my flight, and my travel maybe the week before that. Didn't know I was even going (laughs) to (laughs) go. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually in Alaska, and so Raynette is in uh, Wyoming. Yeah, so kind of random. Maybe not random, but we met in uh, North Carolina um, for a conference, the ACPA National Institute for uh, Native Leadership and Higher Education. So that's what we uh, where we connected in uh, North Carolina. And that's just that is just so ironic. It's like in North Carolina now you're in Alaska and I'm in Wyoming. I know. <laughs> Just so oh, all these places that people are like, oh, <laughs> wow. I know. And it's funny because the reason why we connected is that we have a mutual connection. Um, our friend, uh, Dr. Amanda Leclerc Diaz. And so Amanda, Dr. Diaz, she actually went to the University of Arizona, which is my alma mater. And then how did you know uh, Dr. Leclerc? Um, I'm actually, okay, so we I'm related to her, but we didn't know that until we met in college. And so <laughs> okay. we to college, we um, joined a, a multicultural um, kind of Latina based sorority together. And so we kind of go way, way back to our very first years of college. And then, yeah. And so we've all stayed connected to, I stayed connected with um, her her all these years and get to see her once in a great, great while. And then, so um, that day that we got to the conference, I put it on Snapchat that I was there and she was like, oh my gosh, I have a friend there. And not even knowing just within minutes, I was a minutes away from meeting you. Like it was, (laughs) Really? I was like, wow, because I was a little nervous, didn't know anybody. I was my first time attending this. And so oh. I walked in and I'm like, I'm all nervous and scared. And then just sit down and what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know. And then Dr. Leclerc Diaz, like she, oh my gosh, I love Amanda. Well, we share the same name, but <laughs> um, Dr. Amanda Leclerc Diaz, like she recently got her PhD last year, I believe. And I got my PhD the year before. And so Amanda was always, always, always encouraging me to um, finish my PhD. And so I love Amanda so much. And so to have this mutual connection uh, was really yeah, fun. Yeah. And we're from like the same reservation. In Wind River, we're from the same tribe. I actually ran into her two weeks ago at a local grocery store. Like literally, oh. we're passing each other. She had a mask on though, and she took it off, and I was like, "Amanda!" She goes, I just seen your son because he works there, and so she was like, "I just seen him. Oh my gosh, I get to see you!" And then we hugged, and then I was like, already like throwing gigs out at her, probably how me and you did. So yeah. I'm holding. So I'm like, "Can you do this? Can you do that?" And then I was like, "Well, I'll send an email. We'll talk about it later." Like mid grocery store. So it was cool. I got to actually hug her. Like just. Two weeks ago oh that's awesome yeah Amanda is so amazing so um as we all know our community is so small and so connected so it's uh really neat how I also think that's like a perfect example of all of this yeah right shows how like native country is so small I mean here we are in North Carolina you're from here I'm from there and we meet and we have a mutual, uh, mutual friend. <laughs> I know it's so, so yeah, it's so amazing. And now fast forward to now, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's where uh, we, we uh, recruited Raynette to be a part of the uh, IPKC 
professional development co-chair with me because I thought it'd be really cool. Um, and our um, leadership also thought it'd be really cool to have co-chairs. So uh, that's how we're here today. And I also so really liked how um, IPKC like just took me in. I mean, I think you only told one or two in the room, like, hey, I'm going to recruit her. And then by the end, they were like, we're taking a picture. Renette, get in the picture. I was like, oh, <laughs> I didn't even sign up yet, but okay. So it basically just got told I was part of the group. I still yes. that, but it was just nice to get recruited by this because I, I, I mean, I'm super thankful and honored to be recruited by this just that easy and that quick because I'm pretty soon yeah. to was like, get a new paperwork, do this, do that. And <laughs> Here I am. So it was just funny how we just right away just got recruited. I got recruited by you. All. Yeah, totally. Right there in North Carolina. <laughs> Every time I say that, I always think of that one song from like the 90s or 2000s. Uh, is it Bubba Sparks? He's like, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Petey Bobs. Remember, oh, he has, remember he has Petey Pablo? He has that shirt. And Petey Pablo, like, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All <laughs> he's right. all spinning it around and he's all oh North my Carolina. Gosh. I know. Every time I say that, I don't even know. I'm, I mean, I'm from the older school kind of. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so... Uh, but today, um, it's going to be really special. We're going to share um, some stories and just really ground ourselves in different ways. We're going to share more stories about really at the core of what it means to be an Indigenous relative in higher education. Uh, but before we jump into that, it's really important that we introduce ourselves and we ground ourselves in our own way. Um, and so, Raynette, uh, please uh, share who you are, a little bit more about yourself. <clears throat> Dos, my name is Renette. Curry, I am, um, so I'm enrolled in the Northern Arapaho tribe, but um, I think as a lot of Native people can relate, we're kind of inner tribal and we're mixed. So I have, I'm fortunate to be from other tribes as well. So my dad is enrolled in the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe um, in Nevada. And he was all, but he was also raised in the, on the Northern Ute reservation. So he's Northern Ute as well in um, Fort Duchesne, Utah. And so he grew up uh, really close to, you know, his family in Utah, but he, his mom's family was from Nevada. And so he stayed, he's tried to stay as connected as he could. So in turn, um, you know, my mom's from the Wind River in Wyoming. So he, when he met my mom, he stayed there and, and we kind of lived this life of um, traveling back and forth to all our families. So we stayed really connected to each of our tribes and our families. And I, I'm super thankful for that. But um, to be from different, even though I'm enrolled in one tribe, you know, I really identify with all three of my tribes, because I wouldn't be here without that. Um, and I'm also really, really blessed to have like a household that has a lot, even more tribes added to that. So my little 11 um, year old son is Eastern Shoshone. And, um, and that's for he's enrolled Eastern Shoshone, plus all the tribes from me. And then my oldest son is enrolled at Arapaho, but he, um, he also his dad's crow. So he comes from the Crow tribe in Montana. And then my two nieces are Arapaho and all the tribes we we are. So it's kind of cool to have all these different tribes and different families, because as Native people are, we're all connected to all of those tribes. And we're thankful for, you know, Huda's Crow family, who's also my family as well. And then just the family in Utah and Nevada, and just to stay connected to how we're all related, um, that, that kind of just goes into who I am as my story. And, and I'm a mom. So I am on top of what, what I do. I'm the director of the Native Center at the University of Wyoming. And I'm also a full-time mother. And so um, I tell everybody that I do college basically 24-7 because I have three college kids of my own and then four with my daughter-in-law. And so um, I've been doing college. I mean, I don't get to just check clock out at the end of work and go home. I'm talking college at home. I'm talking college all the time. So like higher education is just ingrained in me right now in this moment in my life and in my journey I'm on now. So um, forever, you know, I was helping my kids or my students or myself, myself, you know, with my job. And so um, higher education is just kind of ingrained in me right now. And I'm just thankful to be on that path. Um, but I also got my degrees here at the University of Wyoming where I work. So I'm familiar with the area, familiar with the institution, um, have seen it grow over the last 20 ish years. And so, um, and just thankful to be a part of that. So, but being able to be alum from this school also um, represents like really who I am too, because um, my reservation is only three hours away from this institution. And so I get to be kind of close to home, but then I'm still away. And so I'm helping our native students, um, trying to, trying to, I guess, to adapt to their new life here at college and keep a home for them here at the Native Center, as well as um, stay connected to home as well, because that's super important. So that's just a little bit about me. 
And also, um, I, I'm a dog mom. I have a, a dog named MJ. Um, she, she is, um, I can't have pets at my place right now. So she gets to, we get to have visitation with her when we go home because she stays with her auntie. And so we love our having a dog, but we don't get to actually live with her. We just get to see her when we do go home because I have another home on the reservation. So I get to bring her with me. But yeah, so that's a little bit about me. I have a um, partner right now who we're just trying to navigate life together and um, we're new. So we're, yeah, we just have a lot going on and it's exciting. Awesome. Yeah, we uh, are uh, Facebook friends and uh, Snapchat friends, so I always enjoy seeing your uh, community and your family get together. It seems like you have a lot of fun uh, all <laughs> together. It always seems like there's a barbecue or a birthday party or something happening. <laughs> yeah, we're always doing something. Also, one thing I really like to share is I'm going to be a grandma in probably a few weeks. I don't even oh know. Oh, my her. goodness. Yeah, I think the due date's February 18th, but um, she, I, she can come, you know, anytime. And it's a grand, she, she, her, um, it's a girl. And so we're getting ready for her. And so that's really exciting right now. So we're having all this excitement but so much new changes in our lives and we went through so much too as well um we had a lot of challenges and struggles as a family in the last um two and a half years but to us this is a blessing and so we're really excited because we experienced a lot of loss and grief and trauma and so now we're all um, getting ready for her to be here oh that's awesome so special yeah. i look forward to seeing the uh what, what? pictures on facebook and yeah so i'll keep you updated but like same with you because you i like i said when even when i met you remember you were like let's do this tiktok and yeah then TikTok and then you were, you shared your thing with me and then i was like oh my god amanda you never told me and so that's where i enjoy watching everything that you share too yeah that is such a funny connection i forgot about that um <laughs> Wow, we were like connecting yeah on social media and I was like hey like what's your TikTok I'll follow you whatever and then she was already like following me but I was like oh of course you know I don't know on TikTok it's kind of more in yeah form. but that was wild I was like oh my god I watch your videos like I know who you are and oh that was a whole nother thing That's so funny yeah all these connections uh, I like to make a lot of stories about um, indigenous like scholarships, focus scholarships and how uh, native students can succeed. And so a lot of times it's how I get connected with that. And I think that's probably the first video where I followed you at was I think you shared a list of scholarships. You were giving oh, tips yeah. to college kids like, hey, how this is what you do. This is what, you know, this is some of the scholarships that are out there. And like, I, I even think there was one you were sharing that you um, went to your college with, you know, being funded, fully funded. Yeah. And, so you were talking about that. and I think that's where I followed you. And I, I was even talking to my students before I even met you about you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So <laughs> <laughs> yeah gosh it's so special you Anyways, know go to your intro so that we can <laughs> <laughs> well first we should have a commercial break okay we're talking about scholarships really quick so if you have yeah. a pen and paper get it out really quick because these are at the top of my head but um students like native students should be applying for these scholarships one the cobell scholarship that one is a very lengthy scholarship, so that one takes some time. Make sure you um, have students fill that one out. Um, there's the American Indian Education Fund. That one is a very short scholarship. Um, that one is pretty quick to fill out. Um, there is the Teresa A. Mike Scholarship. I'm a huge advocate for this one. Teresa spelled T-H-E-R-E-S-A. Um, a Mike and my KE scholarship. That one's based out of California. I am so grateful for that scholarship. Um, there's the American Indian College Fund. That one's based out of Denver. That one really focuses on serving um, tribal student or students who go to tribal schools or universities. Um, and then there's Native Forward, who just changed their name recently within the last year or so. Um, they have tons of scholarships on there. Um, the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, of course, those who are in STEM, make sure that you send students that way and I think that's all I got for right now <laughs> so, I love that. thanks for that commercial we needed that for real yeah. I, even I was taking notes oh, my yeah. <laughs> oh American Indian services that's another one too AIAS yes <laughs> so yeah those are the ones students should be looking up to see if they qualify for different scholarships and of course through um their own tribal communities too because there's different scholarship opportunities usually that way too and university and college scholarships too so anyways I know I always love to talk about scholarships because it helped get me through school um but um I would just like to introduce myself a little bit more formally I guess um in my native language um but go watch say hopa um 
Guishi Sa'au, Baho Pasho, where we shot Sastra next year, Shawa Matsani. Um, I greeted you in the language called Karis, which is spoken by our Pueblo communities in New Mexico. Um, so fun fact, I'm from the same tribal community as Secretary Deb Holland. Um, and so I I often think about like out of all the tribal communities in our country, like how how she's in she's from like our tribal community like that's so special to me um mm -hmm. I still want to meet her if you have a connection let me know <laughs> I still want to <laughs> meet with her um but uh but yeah so I um currently work as the assistant senior director here at the University of Alaska Anchorage um and so I positioned my camera in this way so you can see what the light looks like <laughs> um it's dark most days like when you come into work it's dark and then when you leave it's dark so getting used to the environment here has been um been pretty fun to I also notice it got lighter from when we first started so it did yeah okay that's interesting yeah it's lunch time here and it's been yeah wow yeah, since we're in winter now, of course, we get less sunlight, but um, in the summertime, it's just like light, like 20, 21 hours, 22 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so it's it's really been really um, an adventure to connect with the land here and the environment. But um, you have yeah. a small, small question. Do you have um, when you first got there, like sleep schedule like that? How does that affect like the light? Like, is it hard to sleep when it's all light in those days or do you have to really darken your <laughs> yeah um I I think it's actually pretty easy to transition I think into um an environment where it's sunlight all the time mm -hmm. um I mean a lot of time it's really neat because with the seasonal change like I mean when it's light you a lot of people go fishing at like two in the morning or like three in the morning because there's sunlight and so but wow. when I sleep though it's I mean I have like dark out curtains in my room so blackout curtains so yeah. it's it helps, I think, but um, it, it is really exciting when it's sunlight all the time. It's so much fun. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this next summer. Um, I see myself here in Alaska, at least for the next few years, at least like five years or so. I, I really enjoy my job and my work. I um, help outreach to our indigenous communities here in Alaska, which is a massive state. Um, and so I do rural travel to our communities like Bethel and Kotzebue. Um, I'm a part of the Acceleration Academy components here in our program with the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program. And so uh, we engage students in STEM and, and enroll them, help enroll them in college courses while they're still in high school. So they are finishing high school at this accelerated rate and um, connect them into the STEM field. So it's really an awesome program. But within our, our program, the one that I oversee, there's about 150 um, students and about 70% identify as Alaska Native or, or American Indian. So, oh, wow. okay. um, so there, there are a lot of similarities, but a lot of differences that I've, I've noticed within among our indigenous communities. Like this is my observation that uh, Indian country isn't really used. Indian country isn't really used. We're in the lower 48. That's something that's readily just accepted, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not a part of the vernacular like it's um it's very different like that i don't think there's a lot of um, folks that identify with that term so i'm trying to be more inclusive and think about maybe like native america like that, oh, okay. that it's more um appropriate and so there's just a lot of differences that i'm like realizing but but almost half of the federally recognized tribes are in alaska so that's like amazing to me out of the like 574 recognized tribes, like almost wow. half, really yeah. fascinating. There's like a whole nother structure here. Um, here I also like, see where you do a lot of like traveling and you have to fly into all these communities, right? Whereas here we just, you know, on the lower 48, we're just traveling from state to state. You like fly into those actual communities and you have to take your everything with you, right? Yeah, like the supplies. <laughs> stuff, yeah. yeah, all your supplies. Being on a road system, uh, and it's crazy to think about it like that because, you know, down in the States, it's like you're always almost on a road system <laughs> of some yeah. sort, whether it's dirt road or a highway or you can connect, right? But here, though, the road system ends at a certain point, right? Like, so so yeah. it, it brings just like a whole nother level of um, understanding about access to water, to resources, to food, to gas, subsistence way of living. Like it's just really different. And so I'm, I love learning about how the Alaska native relatives here have of course been on this land since time immemorial. And I just have so much respect for the communities here because these are harsh 
harsh conditions like winter conditions like you go outside in the winter it is freezing <laughs> to me you know you hit these negative temperatures but our alaska native relatives have been here and know how to um, navigate the weather and not even navigate but thrive in all types of weather it's remarkable yes, that's amazing oh, and here so we that. are in wyoming like we're winter now snow cold but you know we know it's coming to an end like i'm like february march you know getting excited because march time it'll start warming up a little and so um but i just yeah i just totally give um props to the communities up there and the strength and resiliency they show to be able to survive those conditions and just like you said thrive that's so amazing about native people too that's just something that we all carry and i think it still reflects to our communities and our people and who we are as individuals just super resilient as we you know share more a little bit more about our stories i'm really curious to know like your perspective about what does it mean for you to be an indigenous relative in higher education <clears throat> oh that's a really good question i when I think about that, like right away, what came to my mind was just, it means a lot to me to be able to give back to our community, our youth, and a lot of what I do. I mean, because I was a young mom, I had my son at 18 years old. And so I already w and came into my adulthood being a mother. And so I think that really um, changed my view, my view of life and the way I th see things because I became a mother at su such a young age. So my whole adult life, I've been a mom. So that's all I've ever known is that motherly instinct that, you know, I got to do what I have to do to survive, but also to better my son's life. Like I really wanted him to um, live a good life. I wanted him to go to college. I wanted him to, I wanted to show him that it was possible. And like one of my best friends always says like, you know, little native kids, if they see someone like them doing it, they're going to do it too. And so um, I always, I always believe in that too. And when he says that, I, I really resonate with that because I was that little native kid that had um, native teachers. I only had one or two while I was growing up and I always wanted more because, you know, I didn't get a lot of native teachers in our school system. But um, so that's what made me want to go into um, teaching. So my first undergraduate, my undergraduate degree was in teaching. And it was with, um, I wanted, my whole dream was to go back to the reservation and teach little kids to read and write and to do all these cool things and um, sing the songs and have fun with them. And I was just so into little kids. And then I had my own. <laughs> then it was just like, oh my gosh, like I had to put a lot into it. And I was trying to go to college and have my kid. And so like a lot of how I see as an indigenous relative in higher education is just really modeling that too and wanting what's best for our communities and our youth. And I just... 100% believe in education, you know, and whether, and it doesn't have to be, um, you know, like a university, a community college or specific, it could be any kind of education, just learning, just learning. And I really encourage that to, to our community and our youth and my own kids and my family is just um, find a path that has to do with learning. Cause we're just, we as humans are just incredible. We can soak everything in. We're sponges. We just, and as native people specifically, like being a um, native, a rel, an indigenous relative in higher ed, it's just, it means so much to me. And I just passionate about being in higher ed. Um, I also got to, you know, be a native student in higher ed, but then come now come around and do full circle. And now I'm a director of a native center that's providing services for our native students. So that's what really, really guides me is my own journey through higher ed. And then now I just want to give back and that's kind of where my passion lies to be a good indigenous relative and to share my knowledge on with our native youth and um, our and I have some non-traditional students who are older too and like we really get to connect because even though they're in college you know I always tell them there's not a certain age you have to get your degree by like you don't believe in that like when you're ready to go back to college you're ready and you know when you're ready and even if it's at a later later phase in your life or an age that's okay and so um I, I really encourage our non-traditional students to, to continue on this path. And it doesn't matter about age and there's no time length or time limit or timeline, you know, it's just like, it's on your time and when you're ready. And, and, um, and I have somebody who recently told me that like, but Renette, it was a lot of what you shared one time. Like it really pushed me because I, I, you know, I thought I was too old to go to college, but you sat there and really encouraged me and didn't matter if I had kids, didn't matter if I was, you know, this age, you still encouraged it. And so with me, you know, going back to get my master's degree, I was older. And so I feel like I learned more when I was older, 
Um, I was just like probably typical college student, young and dumb when I was young, um, but I grew so much by the time it came to grad school. So now it's just all about like really giving back and modeling that for my community and youth and then being an advocate at higher on higher education, especially on this um, institution, I have to advocate for our Native people. Um, some days are battles. You know, some days I have to have, have hard and tough conversations, but it's always for the best of my native people and my tribal people. And, um, you know, I serve a, a number of tribes, but primarily Wind River Reservation tribes are Apple and Shoshone. So I'm always advocating for them. I never do anything just for myself. Like I do it for my people, my kids and my community. So that's what kind of what it means to me. And that's my passion. Wow, that's awesome. I agree with so many things that you had said and reflect. You mentioned a lot of things that I, you know, really ascribe to and can resonate with. You can hire ed. There's so many different routes within higher education and it can be co quite complex sometimes, like moving in and out of being a student or going back to be a professional, being a student again, or being both at the same time. Like, um, I, in my educational journey, like a lot of my family members have gone to college and I think that's very rare within our native communities. And I think it's becoming less rare for sure. Um, but I have so many family members that have advanced degrees and in different areas and engineering and social work and all kinds of other stuff. And uh, my mom has her PhD in clinical psychology, like her being an example. And she was a young mom too. She was 18 when she had me. And mm -hmm. so definitely I, I saw, you know, from, you know, being a, uh, my mom being a young mom, like how the different struggles and financial struggles we had, even like looking for babysitters, all kinds of stuff. Like, um, but what my mom instilled in me from a very young age is to have this tenacity and to have this like endurance and this desire to give back to our native community. Like, I think that's what it really is, is about giving back to our, our native students and giving back to our communities in these different ways, because we're we're placed, we have these different spheres of influence, you know, like within our communities. And, and I just want to acknowledge too, that I recognize within our native communities that there's so many knowledge keepers and knowledge holders that um, in their own right, have their own PhDs, right? Like and have their own mm -hmm. masters and own degrees, you know, in these um, mm -hmm. knowledge systems. And I think that's so special and so sacred uh, in so many ways. But I think when I think about being an indigenous relative, it's exactly what's happening right here, right? Like we're storytelling, we're sharing stories, we're connecting, even though we're thousands of miles away. <laughs> um, I, it's neat to, to come into these spaces to share stories. I think that's a big part of being an indigenous relative is sharing stories. And I love sharing stories in all these different platforms. TikTok is a really interesting platform that I've really gotten more into because I engage a lot with the community members um, that I may not have necessarily have in other spaces. So I think that's really been really special to connect with different students on TikTok and with different community partners. Like it's been really neat through to use social media as a way to connect with our, our colleagues and, and students um, in higher education. So that's been really, really cool. Yeah. And uh, I think that's just something that we're kind of like um, this whole generation has taken us into is the social media to where we can use it to our benefit, you know, there's, it's harmful in some ways, and there's some negative and pros and cons to it, just like anything else. But I think to really use these platforms to get our voices out there, our stories heard, and, um, you know, how you can relate to community members and other students, and they can reach out to you, and you're just, you're just this big resource on TikTok, and being able to find that and use that, like, I think that's just a big strength of your story that, you know, where we're at today. I think as a, a mentor and as a colleague, as a friend, as a relative, I think the biggest charge that I have, that I feel that I have is to build the confidence of our indigenous people and specifically our indigenous students. Like if I can help with that process, that's what I feel like my life life goal is within the realm of higher education is because once you build the confidence of somebody, like there is no telling what that person can do. And I think one way that I try to do that is through kind words. A lot of times, like with students, like I'll, I'll just say simple words, which I believe, you know, that you are loved and that you are worthy, you are intelligent, you're brilliant. I really believe that about our indigenous community and our indigenous students, especially being able to do that, like through TikTok or through promotional materials, like, or through, you know, just words, like how you speak to somebody I think is so important yeah I think so too and I relate to that too with my students and with my own kids you know like 
really trying to be positive and encourage them to be positive and um you know but also just be well like holistically well and you know that takes a lot of work and a lot of healing from all different ways but um so as they're you know doing their college journey i really encourage wellness too i really want them to heal and work on themselves at the same time as they're going to college because like they're going to be such a driving force when they get done and you know to be able to because some of these things i wasn't taught until later in life and it's like, well, if I only knew that when I was young or that age, um, who knows where I'd be now if I'm already right here, you know? And so I really try to give those kind of tools to, to students is to just be well and to take care of ourselves and to work on some of our healing that we need to do too. As we um, talk about like our career and our professions in, in higher education, um, what would you say, like what's some, what's some advice you have for other Indigenous practitioners in the field of higher education? Um, some advice I have is... Um, I think what I really learned in this in this five years I've been you know here at the University of Wyoming on the staff side of it every student's unique every student's so different they have some so much different strengths but then they have so much different um different ways that they go about things or the way that their families come from and and you know sometimes people just lump us all together as natives and they don't really realize that there's like so much more that comes with us when we go to college and so when you're working with native college students and working with especially directly just really remembering them as an individual first to you know really seeing them as an individual and then you know um, where they come from and in their environment we're just a product of our, of our environment and so um, coming to college and leaving leaving their home to come here they're bringing a lot of baggage with them and that's just how we are as native students you know like a lot of my native students you know bring a lot of responsibilities with them when they come to college and they don't leave those at home and we're not going to you know it's just us as native people how we're just collective you know we're just really community oriented and we're family oriented and so we carry some of those responsibilities with us with college and so for me I guess my yeah like my best advice is just to really not lump all our native students into one group just getting to know them individually really really helps and you could be you know you can become a really good mentor or a good person in their life that they can turn to if you can just understand where they're coming from and hear their story out as well just not lump us all together because every student that I serve is super different in so many ways and I love them but I and of course I love when they're all together and they're all in one room I mean I'm, we'd laugh our laughs are endless our jokes our native humor of course comes out but getting those one-on-one -on -one times with practitioners that are working with native students I really encourage that one-on-one -on -one time and I know it's hard to do come by sometimes because you're doing a lot of maybe like if you're in a position like us there's a lot of admin stuff too um, but to have that direct contact with native students and make time for those one-on-ones to me is super important I agree that connection is so so powerful and, and impactful when uh Raynette and one of her students uh Juwan came to the conference that we met at last summer. Juwan is an under undergraduate student. And yes. do you want to share a little bit more about him? Because it was such a memorable <laughs> connection. You know, he's going to be so mad at me for talking about him on the podcast. <laughs> you can't help it. Me and you can't help it, right? No, um, it's true. Because <laughs> um, he's super like, okay, he's an old soul. He's a native student who's old, an old soul. He teaches me so much. He's just, he's really knowledgeable. He was really fortunate to be raised by his grandma who just passed on so much knowledge to him when it comes traditionally. But yet he's super, super like book smart and just has so much like an intellectual like abilities that, you know, just can exceed anything. But he is super, super humorous, like funny in his sense of humor. And sometimes it's dry and you don't know if to laugh because is it serious? Is it not? And I think he came off like that to everybody at the conference at first. And I was like, okay, Joanne, like, you know, like, take it easy. I always have to tell him, like, take it easy on some people don't know if you're joking or not. Um, <laughs> and they get to know you. And then they're like, okay, so, you know, the funny story about the conferences, and I know this probably stuck with everybody at the conference, but he made such an impression on everybody is, um, you know, he said his, our prayer, he prayed and he, in his introduction, and I think he prayed and did an introduction, but he did it all in our language, our Rappo language. And, um, and then he just passed on, went to the next person and he kind of, and I think a lot of people came up to him later. And so they kind of, kind of were left hanging. Like they wanted to know what he said, cause he was just so into what he was saying. And, um, and then people were like, Juwan, like they went up to him after, what were you saying? And then I, you know, I had nudged him and said, maybe you should translate. Cause like, people were still looking at him, like, we want to know more, like keep talking. And, um, and then he just continued on, but that's just Juwan. Like he just left 
kept everybody hanging. So then there was a lot of people coming up to him afterwards and were like, can we, can you translate a little bit to us? And you know, half of that was, he was kind of joking. Like he wasn't like, he's just so funny all the time that he wasn't like gonna translate himself of what he had just said, just to keep everybody hanging on purpose, on purpose. Yeah. That's the thing he does. <laughs> well, he, at the end, I remember that he spoke the language. And then at the end, all he said in English, he was like, I do what she tells me to do. And then he sat <laughs> down. <laughs> That's what I remember. And then I remember him saying, like, when people were asking him, like, you know, what did you say? And he's like, at this point, it's between me and the creator. <laughs> That's hilarious because yeah. he's like, do why you just called me out? Because remember, he mentioned that he was my intern at the meeting. Call her out. <laughs> yeah, he called me out and I was like, I just do what she tells me. So it just made me look like, which I, I admit, I'm pretty bossy. Everybody <laughs> knows I'm like the bossy one. Um, and I've had people write to my face say, you're the bossy one, do this. <laughs> And I just, I've embraced it before I would get a little offended when people would say that about me. Now I just embrace it. I'm like, you're right. I am. So yeah, people do this. So Jawan kind of outed me on that one. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. I would love it actually brought a student to something like that. And maybe that's something, some advice we can pass on too, is expose your students to new opportunities. Give them some, some equal opportunities that you have. Like if you have a chance to take a student to somewhere like that, to just open their eyes. And because I'm sure all of of us have made a lasting impact on his life he still talks about that trip and the people we met and some of the things and you know I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up in higher education too as a pra practitioner himself he may not admit it now but you know like he loved his time there and so and I know everyone loved him too <laughs> oh that's so awesome that it was so special meeting Juwan and I think this goes to what Raynette was talking about that connection with the students and like getting to know them and you know, I remember there was one vivid memory when we were on the beach and uh, Juwan has his long hair <laughs> and we're like, Juwan, run. And then we put him in slow motion on the video. <laughs> so he was like native Baywatch. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. You know, it was just, it was fun connecting with him. It was a very special moment in time for me. And I, I just met Juwan and, and Raynette, of course, but uh, <laughs> it was so much fun. And I just remember being in the Waffle House. We had, we went after like the conference, you know, we went to the Waffle House and I just remember <laughs> laughing, like laughing so hard that my cheeks were hurting, my face. Hey, hey. You know, just thinking of it makes me laugh because I just yeah. know laughter was shared during that. And it was the so the ironic thing was all the stories we were telling were like true, real stories but they were like our tribal stories are like something from home that we were sharing with the group. And they were so funny, but like everybody had just jokes for days. I think no matter what tribe we, and then we kind of related that we're like, well, all the tribes we're all from different tribes sitting at that table, but it was, we could relate to each other so much. <laughs> Folks who are listening. I feel like I, I hope that some of these stories that we're sharing remind you of stories in your own journey of, you know, as we connect with our community and our students and this field is so dynamic higher education is so dynamic and you know there's a part of being a student and there's a part of being a practitioner and sometimes at the same time my my advice uh, some of my advice is that if you're a student and getting your degree whether that's your master's or your PhD my advice and, and my encouragement rather is that it's all worth it like it's it's really interesting how the field of education works and how our society works here in the United States that I know that as I've earned my degree in uh, higher education, uh, my PhD in higher education, people treat me differently. And it's really fascinating to see how this occurs. And, and among our native people, when I relate to our native communities, like I don't, I don't start off like, oh, I am doctor whatever, you know, yeah, like it, that just, yeah. it just doesn't mm -hmm. matter to me in those spaces. Yeah. Like it, like yeah. I mentioned before, when you're in, among elders, like it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. Like, you know, there's a, there's also that misconception though that it does, and that we see that we identify as those degrees. But like that's it's it's like a stereotype misconception of us that are educated. But really, like I was just telling my partner the other day, like I don't, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm educated and they're not. Like, man, if I vibe with somebody, I don't even. Then that comes out later, and then it does. But it's not something you like you said. We just bring up like, oh, I got. This 
this degree or I got my master's yeah, degree. No. You know, we just don't, we don't, that doesn't matter to me. Like, it's just, it's there. But like I said, it's just, it's, it's about the person and who they are. And if you vibe and if you don't, you know, it's just, and then it doesn't have to do with really introducing ourselves with our education. That doesn't, it's not a thing. It's the connection to the people, connection to mm-hmm. the land, connection to the resources yeah. like, among our native people. Like, and when I'm in spheres where there aren't native people or yeah. where I'm in spheres where there's no people of color or no indigenous people, people treat me differently. And it's really fascinating how that happens. Um, I but I, I'm very intentional and it feels uncomfortable sometimes too, even with my title or my, my designation as a PhD. I know that when I say, hi, I'm Dr. Amanda Chermaya and in non-native spaces or where there's no people of color, I know that there's, there's something different, like people treat me differently. So I've, I've learned to get more confident in like the title that I have, the designation as a PhD. I think overall though, as you're in your different degree programs, I think it's so worth it, especially as you consider pursuing your PhD, Raynette. <laughs> I think you should pursue oh, Maybe we're not. I was like trying to space out and not hope that you're talking because that's like the, okay, so this is two days in a row that it's been brought up. That's why I'm like, they're all going to get on it. And- Oh gosh, just the thought of that stresses me out. I know. I it can be very intimidating and it, <laughs> it is very hard. I'm not even gonna lie, it's so hard because it's always yeah. like you gotta write and it's like this cloud, like you should be writing, you should be writing, you know, like <laughs> it's worth it because at the end you're not gonna be writing all the time. Now I get to write for fun, which is cool. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. You know, and um, definitely. And I know we were talking about, you know, p- potentially later episodes, speaking with some PhD um, students or people are who have got their PhD degrees and like just moved on into that. And uh, that's super interesting to me. It's something I'm interested in for sure. It's like one of those things I like laid out in life and I do want to get there. But right now I'm just going to live my best life. Sorry. And best yeah. life does not mean being a student right now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> because I just, it's so stressful. But like, you know, I'm sure it's worth it. And I admire everybody that has their PhD, especially from our native communities. Like I know, I know what the sacrifice it took to get those. That that I like to share is that, um, so out of all the PhDs awarded to indigenous people, 0.001% of natives earn a PhD in the field of higher education. That is oh, so that small. Is so small, huh? So small. But um doesn't that, doesn't that feel good to you though that you're like a part of that um it's, small, small percent. I mean it's such an accomplishment. Honored. I'm definitely mm-hmm. honored. Especially went to college, my graduate, my master's and my PhD were all covered through scholarships. So that was over like seventy five thousand wow. dollars. I mean, and that's, that said, that's exactly what to the listeners what we want to get out especially from Amanda's stories like she gets she went to she got her degrees you know with debt free from scholarships because it's possible you know it's possible to go to college and be debt free like you don't have to take out the loans you can go all from scholarships I don't know how many times I say that but yeah <laughs> they have to listen to me one through out the ear one ear out the other but I say it all the time and you're a perfect example of that I appreciate that so this space you know it's called sacred grounds and as we've done this for our first episode it is really special just to connect and to be able to share stories and you know come into these these different spaces even though we're thousands of miles away as we kind of close out here and we recognize that our stories are our own stories that we're not yes. speaking on yes. behalf of Native America. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are not speaking for every Native. <laughs> yes, I know, or every tribe, yeah. Yeah, um, we're not the voice of every Native out there. <laughs> in the college, in higher education. Of Native America. <laughs> um, you know, as we do these episodes, we're going to be sharing different topics in regards, you know, within our field of higher education and We look forward to hosting more guests, but before we close, any closing words? I'm just super grateful and honored for to even just be in the space with you. And I think we, I think we vibe and that's always going to be how it is. And yeah, we're just going to have some good episodes and I hope people come back and keep listening and keep hearing our stories. And like you said, being part of native, our, our native culture is shared storytelling. We can all relate to each other in that way. So I'm thankful for your stories, everything you share. It's like every time I talk to you, inspire, motivate me some way or another, whether it's intentional or not. (laughs) 
Well, I, I agree. It, it's always a good day when uh, you connect with Raynette, whether it's on social media or here <laughs> on our podcast. Like, yeah, I agree. That's why she's my uh, conference BFF. We just uh, get along really well, even though we haven't talked in months, really. <laughs> like, we we should have been, but we were so, we could not get on the same schedule. I, I had a coworker, by the way, tell me yesterday, I keep looking at your calendar to schedule something. It says busy all day. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's kind of my life <laughs> so i'm glad that we can finally connect um, yeah, me but, too, uh, me too. Uh, we'll have more episodes coming subscribe share with your friends we look forward to uh, sharing more stories in the future thank you all right see y'all later